architect Divya Chakravarti. She completed her undergraduate studies from SRM University and she went on to pursue her masters in historic preservation and urbanism and study of the built environment from the University of California, Los Angeles. She went on to work for the Department of Planning and Preservation for the city of Pasadena, California. She also did a brief stint of work for Historic Scotland, Edinburgh, UK. She had also worked on conservation projects like Kalsa Mahal, Gokhale Hall in Chennai and Marimala Park Educational Trust in Mysore. She is currently working as the director of Samrakshan Heritage Consultancy. She is also a co-founder of the Artisan Reprisal of Traditional Materials. method and technology she goes on to conduct workshops to revive traditional and lost methods of construction welcome to the ugc lecture series for bachelors of architecture the subject we are discussing is human settlements planning the topic we are delving into is planning concepts in this we will be looking into lee corbusier and his contributions and a case study of the city of chandigarh if you look at the main contributions of Corbusier his main concept was let's not keep urban planning as a theory by itself we need to include architecture as well as construction technology into that to come up with a proper planning of any urban establishment this concept resulted in the publication of three human establishments the examination of working conditions in a mechanistic society led to the recognition of utility and necessity of three unit establishments indispensable for human activity the farming unit the cooperative village this is a unit for agricultural production the linear industrial city the radio concentric city same as the radiant city for the exchange of goods and services if you look at the background of ville contemporain which is the philosophy of corbusier No matter how open and green city should be frankly urban urban surroundings are to be definitely contrasting with rural surroundings densities are in themselves not a problem congestion and slum conditions in the city are due to excessive coverage persistence of old street patterns and unrestricted land speculation slums exist because of the failure to provide the proper surrounding for a high density living he protests against strict functionalism human creations that survive are those which produce emotions and not only those which are useful if you look at the start concept of the concentric city which was proposed in 1922 this was a city for 3 million people and was based on four principles decongestion of the center of the cities augmentation of the density enlargement of the means of circulation increase in the number of parks and open spaces so even though corbusier did not want the urban city to look like a rural city or a rural dwelling unit he was very particular that there would be adequate green space lung space a lot of parks he said but even the lung space that you provide has to be planned and constructed not something that is there in the rural environment completely organic and wild so even though a green space was required it was only on purposeful requirement which provided for a lung space or a break from the monotony these were the three zones that he created you have the central city the protected green belt as well as the factories and the satellite towns even though he was very particular about a urban city or a mechanized city he was smart enough to know that the factories should be on the outskirts of the town as far as possible to ensure good quality of living and good quality of life within the residence and even to ensure that the industries would have more space to thrive in the outskirts of the city so he ensured that there would be adequate lung space as a break between the central city and the protected green belt would act like a buffer zone and plus it will act like a lung space for the residential area as well as the central city which is nothing but the commercial district so this is how it would be this is the central city that we see with skyscrapers here you have the green belt which is the buffer zone and the factories outside and these are the different residential complexes 
around. You have apartments, you have single unit family homes, depending on different economic strata. And there was the green belt here and like you see this green belt was constructed with no other purpose than to provide for as an air purification system. This is the central city, a sketch of it, tall skyscrapers with a large open space to provide for flow of light and air and surrounded by again small shrub sort of things, trees to provide for relief. Again, everything that Corbusier was do had done in terms of the green space within his urban planning was all planned and thought for and not done just because greenery is good or reminds us of a rural dwelling. The buildings in the central area were raised on stilts so as to leave panoramas of unbroken greenery at ground level. The general impression was more of a city in a park than of a parkland in the city. The city espoused space, speed, mass production and efficient organization but also offered combination of natural and urban environments. The criticism for this concept was class-based conception of life, different classes being separately housed. Doubts were expressed about the scale and degree of centralization. Like he clearly demarcated tenement housing from single family housing to multiple family housing. So when this classification was so stratified, it obviously creates a class difference in any city scenario. And another thing is when you think of tall skyscrapers, what are the offices that are going to be housed there? Are the commercial districts are also going to be the same? So obviously there was a doubt respect to the how centralized is it going to be and about the scale of the centralization. This is Plan Voisin in 1925. He actually reworked on the plan of the Radiant City and he applied it to a section of Paris. He decided that based on the criticisms and other things that what changes he could make to make the Radiant City a better one. 18 double cruciform 60 storey skyscrapers. You can see the cruciform over here, it's laid out in a cross. They are placed in an orthogonal street pattern grid and park like green space. Three clusters of luxury apartments, there you can see them. The street system he gave a lot of importance to because he knew automobiles were the, basically the future and it's not like easily to be said if you want to have a large city it is not possible to have it completely pedestrianized. Heavy traffic would proceed at the basement level, lighter traffic at ground level, fast traffic should flow along limited access arterial roads that are supplied for rapid and unobstructive cross city movement, pedestrianized streets wholly separated from vehicular traffic and are placed at a raised level so as to ensure the safety of both the pedestrians and to ensure that the vehicles don't have to go at a slower pace. The number of existing streets would be diminished by two thirds due to new arrangements of housing, leisure facilities and workplaces with same level crossing points eliminated wherever possible. So critics attacked its focus on the central city where land values were highest and dislocations most difficult. The creation of vast empty spaces in place of those close knit streets with their varied civic life. So again here it was criticized that by doing this by having a completely centralized sector in the center with skyscrapers we are creating a steep difference in the land value. So in the center it would be very expensive so even parking of vehicles everything would be expensive and even the commercial area there to sustain that area would end up being more expensive. And because of everything being on stilts and a higher area, there would end up being create uh, vast empty spaces instead of the socially feasible closed knit streets. By having everything raised on stilts and raised platforms, a sense of connectivity was lost. Everybody was in their own plane doing their own things. So a kind of connectivity or a discussion or a dialogue between different players in the urban sector was not happening. Everything was segregated and very mechanical. The next concept Le Corbusier suggested is the linear industrial city. Leaving the evils of the sprawling town, the new industrial communities are located along the main arteries of transportation, that is water, rail and highway, 
connecting the existing cities. Factories are placed along the main arteries, separated from residential section by the highway and a green strip. The residential areas include the horizontal garden town, a single houses, vertical apartment buildings with civic centers, sports, entertainment, shopping and office facilities are equally distributed in this district and all community facilities are placed within ample open space. So again, this city was created keeping the criticisms from the past two layouts that he had suggested. Finally, the Radiant City. He rearranged the key features of the Villa Contemporain. The basic ideas of free circulation and greenery were definitely still present, but the juxtaposition of different land uses had changed. For example, the central area was now residential instead of a skyscraper office core. So now the role was completely changed. So because of having the skyscrapers in the center, everyone was worried about the land value and creating of empty spaces around. So now he made the residences plonk in the center. If you look at the elements of Corbusier's plan, very high density, 1,200 people per acre in skyscrapers, overcrowded sectors of Paris and London, ranged from 169 to 213 people per acre at that point of time. Manhattan has only 81 people per acre, 120 people per acre in luxury houses, 6 to 10 times more denser than current luxury housing in the United States. Multi-level traffic systems to manage the intensity of traffic. The analogy of the city with the abstract image of a man. The skyscrapers or the business area of the Villa Contemporain were rearranged away from the city center at the head. The body was made up of acres of housing strips laid out in a stepping plan to generate semi-courts and harbors of greenery containing tennis courts, playing fields and paths. The traffic pattern was basically an orthogonal system with superimposed diagonals and the civic center is on the main axis light manufacturing, freight yards and heavy industries at the bottom. So his analogy with the body started at that point of time where he decided that for a city to work, for an urban fabric to work where man lived, it had to have some similarities with the anatomy of man. So he decided the commercial would be the head, the body would be the residential area set aside in different levels. And the traffic pattern was going to be the nervous system and the light manufacturing all of that would be the foot of the or the bottom of the body. These are the elements of Corbusier's plan. Access to green space between 48% and 95% of the service area was reserved as green space which was very high considering Lee Corbusier's plan because he has never given importance to green space other than its basic requirement as a cleaning tool in an urban fabric system. So this green space was provided in different forms in the form of gardens, squares, sports fields, restaurants as well as theatres with no sprawl access to the protected zone that is the green belt zone is quite quick and easy. So this was a completely, this layout was suggested on a vertical basis. The logic of increasing urban density. The more dense the population of a city is the less the area, the distances that has to be covered. Traffic is increased by the number of people in the city. The degree to which private transportation is more appealing, that is clean, fast, convenient, cheap than public transportation. The average distance people travel per trip. The number of trips people must take each week. Before public transportation became quite strong and solid and then the advent of the automobiles, that's when all the cars increased, the number of cars completely increased because it was viable, it was doable, it was cheap maintaining it and at that point of time, even fuel was inexpensive. So having a private transportation proved to be cheaper than using public transportation because the government had still not invested that kind of money to develop public transportation. The moral therefore is that we must increase the density of the centers of our city 
where business affairs are carried on. We'll go on to the case study of Chandigarh, which was completely one of Corbusier's best attempts of urban planning and a successful model to a most extent for India post-independence period where India wanted to project that we are still a superpower, we can be a superpower even after the British left us and this was our way of showing that we are going to compete into the modern scenario. Since Punjab was divided into two parts, the capital was left in Pakistan and therefore Punjab and India required a new capital. The first master plan for the new capital was assigned to American engineer and planner Albert Mayer who was a friend of Clarence Stain of Radburn fame in New Jersey. He worked on the master plan with his closest assistant Matthew Nowicki until Nowicki actually died in a plane crash. His duties were to take the form of the architectural control of the city. Mayer wasn't new to India. In December 1949 when the Punjab government approached him for the Chandigarh project he was already associated with a rural development project at Itawa, Uttar Pradesh and preparation of master plans for Greater Bombay and Kanpur. Mayo was thrilled with the prospect of planning a brand new city and he accepted the assignment although it was offered at a very modest fee of $30,000 for the entire project. His brief was to prepare a master plan for a city of half a million people showing the location of major roads and areas for residences, business, industry, recreation and allied uses. He was also to prepare detailed building plans for the capital complex, city centre and important government facilities and architectural controls for other areas. The master plan which Albert Mayer produced for Chandigarh assumes a fan-shaped outline spreading gently to fill the site between the two riverbeds. At the head of the plan was the capital, the seat of the state government and the city. The city centre was located in the heart of the city. Two linear parklands could also be noticed running continuously from the northeast head of the plain to the southwestern tip. A curving network of main roads surrounded the neighbourhood units called super blocks. First phase of the city was to be developed on the northeastern side to accommodate 1,50,000 residents and the second phase on the southwestern side for another 3,50,000 people. So this was the fan shaped layout that we were talking about and this was the centre where it was considered the city centre in the heart of the city and this was the super block where you had the green belt and in centre you had a water body or stream like sort of a thing which was later converted to a, another green belt. So this super block was going to sit in different parts of the city to provide the residential layout of Chandigarh. Mayor liked the variation of Indian streets offsetting and breaking from narrow into wider and back and thought that they were appropriate to a land of strong sunlight. At narrow points, his house design involved an inner courtyard for ventilation with small openings on the street side to protect privacy. We love this inner little courtyard, Mayor wrote, for it seemed to us bring us the advantages of coolness and dignity into a quiet small house. Another element in planning was to place a group of houses around a not very large court with an end somewhat narrowing which could serve as a social unit that is a group of relatives or friends or people from the same locality might live there with a central area for play, gossip etc. The neighbourhood units were to contain schools and local shopping centres. The flatness of the site allowed almost complete freedom in creating street layout and it is of interest to note that the overall pattern deliberately avoids a geometric grid in favour of loosely curving system. The death of Noviki necessitated the selection of a new architect for Chandigarh. When Mayor resigned, the Indian authorities put together a new European planning team. The two appointed administrators, Varma and Thapar, 
decided on the renowned Swiss architect Le Corbusier, whose name was suggested by the British architects Maxwell Fry and his wife Jane Drew. So, till now, Mayer had pretty much put the plan across with the super block, how he is going to have the city centre, how he would have the residential belt and the green belt, and how the streets would have a kind of uh, play of uh, light happening with widening them and narrowing them at certain points. And at the narrow points, houses planned by Nowicki were using the concept of courtyards, again from Indian architecture. But now that Corbusier had come into the picture, he was actually not very interested in coming out to India and working on this plan because it would take him away from all of his other works in Europe. Lee Corbusier's lofty visions and ideals were in harmony with our Prime Minister of that time, Nehru's aspirations. Lee Corbusier requested the assistance of his cousin Pierre Genre. Genre eventually agreed to live on the site as his representative and chief architect. As the most economically and readily available material for building at Chandigarh was the locally made brick. The flat roof was employed throughout in Chandigarh because of its usefulness as a sleeping area. Because there the weather would get quite hot in the summers and the terrace proved to be a soothing, cool sleeping area during summers. 70% of the building would be private in all the sectors. Residential plots ranging in dimensions from 75 square yards to 5,000 square yards. So, Corbusier actually planned to a minuscule detail of every dwelling unit to the city to the very important buildings of the government like the parliament and secretariat. Lee Corbusier was responsible for the general outlines of the master plan and the creation of monumental buildings, while Pierre Genre, Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew were charged with the task of developing the neighbourhood sectors with their schools, shopping bazaars and the tracks of government housing. In the programme presented to architects, 13 categories of houses were specified, each corresponding to a level of government employment. Small window openings have been consistently employed. The city of Chandigarh was the culmination of Corbusier's life. This city is, I was actually like Corbusier himself, not gentle, very hard and assertive, not practical, riddled with mistakes made not in error but in arrogance. It is actually disliked by many people by small minds but not by the big ones. It was an unforgettable experience and the city too is like that. The man who adored the Mediterranean has found fulfillment in the scorching heat of India. Once he started, even though he was not even in initially interested in planning Chandigarh, once he started with the plan, he really got into it and he made sure that this would be a true culmination of his career. Again, here he continued his analogy of the, with the anatomy of man or the biological analogy. Lee Corbusier liked to compare the city he planned to a biological entity. The head was the capital, the city center was the heart, the institutional area and the university were the limbs. Lee Corbusier identified four basic functions of a city, living, working, circulation, and care of the body and spirit. Each sector was provided with its own shopping and community facilities, schools and places of worship. Circulation was of great importance to Corbusier and it determined the other three basic functions of living and working. And when you talk of taking care of body and spirit, it means nothing but culture and entertainment. By creating a hierarchy of roads, Lee Corbusier sought to make every place in the city swiftly and easily accessible and at the same time to ensure tranquility and safety of living spaces. The Periphery Control Act. This act came about in 1952 and it created a wide green belt around the entire Union territory of Chandigarh. It regulated all development within 16 kilometers of the city limit prohibited the establishment of any other town or village and forbade commercial or industrial development. The idea was to guarantee that Chandigarh would always be surrounded by countryside. So Lee Corbusier was a 
literally a very controlling planner. He knew that the future would change, the population would change the layout. And he wanted to ensure that that would not be the case. So he made sure that the government would pass the Periphery Control Act, which would actually restrain any construction around the city of Chandigarh up to a level of 16 kilometers. And beyond this, only any new establishment could come about. The concept of the sector, Lee Corbusier and his team replaced the super blocks, which was mayor's concept, with a geometric matrix of generic neighborhood units called sectors. The new city plan represented a general city that could, like a Roman military settlement, be placed on any flat piece of land. Corbusier claimed that the first phase of existence is to occupy space and the new plan allowed for such an expansion. However, the city was planned to house 1,50,000 people in the first phase and realized between 1951 and 66 that 5 lakh people in its final stage. So initially it was supposed to be only 3,50,000 in the final stage but by now over a period of time that population had increased to 5 lakhs. The neighborhood itself is surrounded by fast traffic roads called V3 intersecting at the junctions of the neighborhood unit called sector with a dimension of 800 by 1200 meters. The entrance of cars into the sectors of 800 by 1200, which are exclusively reserved to family life, can take place at four points, that is in the middle of every sector. All stoppage of circulation shall be prohibited at the four circuses at the angles of these sectors. The bus stops are provided each time at 200 meters from the circus, so as to serve the four pedestrian entrances into the sector. Thus, the transit traffic takes place out of these sectors, the sectors being surrounded by four wall-bound car roads without any openings. So this was actually a novelty in the town planning which was considered very decisive that was applied to Chandigarh. No house or door opens to the thoroughfare or rapid traffic. Taking Chandigarh as an example, we may see at once the democratic idea which allows us to devote an equal care to housing all classes of society to seek new social groupings. Each sector is designated by the number, the capital complex being number one, while the remaining sectors are numbered consecutively beginning at the north corner of the city. There are totally 30 sectors in Chandigarh, out of which 24 are residential. The sectors in the upper edge of the city are of abbreviated size. If you look at some 800 hectares of green open space are spread over approximately 114 square kilometers. In addition, sectors are vertically integrated by green space oriented in the direction of the mountains. Landscaping again was a very important concept, but like we have discussed, his landscaping was supposed to have only functional needs. Aesthetic suitability was not given that much importance. Housing, lower category housing, residential buildings was known by the frame control to control their facades. This actually fixes the building line and height and as well as the use of building materials. The seven V's actually establishes the hierarchy of traffic. V1 being the major roads connecting Chandigarh to other cities. V2 are the major avenues of the city. V3 are the corridors, streets for vehicular traffic and V4 and through V7 are roads within the sectors. So this is the basic plan of the city where you have the sectors and the green belts running across. The main architectural features you can see is the parasol roof forming arches, the use of a double roof to help with the weather colored massive pillars and a full height entrance. The open hand, this sculpture was made by Corbusier to show the outline of a bird and it is named as the pit of consideration to make sure that it's a part of the landscape as well as something like a bird which is ready to take flight, even Chandigarh was considered ready to take flight. At the end of this lecture, we have looked into Corbusier and his contributions and have seen his contribution in the state in Chandigarh as a case study. At the end of this lecture, we should be able to answer the following questions. 
what are the planning concepts developed by Le Corbusier, discuss the contributions of Corbusier in the Indian context, what is a sector, describe the classification of roads in the city of Chandigarh. That brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you.